I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture uh, by Dan Kevlis, Novelties, Frauds and Protections, the nursery business in 19th century America. Dan is a incredibly well-known scholar of um, legal history, uh, of dealt with a range of different areas of intellectual property. He's had a quite a, a long and distinguished career. He is has been in the past a standing Woodward Professor of History and History of Medicine and American Studies at Yale University. And I see from his slide, he's now a visiting interested scholar at NYU Law School. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional people on the land on which we all speak and meet. Thanks, Brad. It's a pleasure to be with you, so to speak. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to tell you all this morning how fruit innovators in the United States sought to protect the intellectual property in their innovations during the 19th century, uh, a period which fell before they could be patented. And first, I think it's okay, I think it's a good idea to, to provide a few words explaining why the US patent system provided no protection for plant novelties, contrary to the contemporary uh, uh, arrangements uh, where uh, plants, uh, along with many other things, can be patented. Uh, since the U.S. Uh, since the Patent Act in 1793, which was the first long-lasting one, the, Thomas Jefferson wrote what uh, might be granted a patent: "Quote uh, any new and useful art, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter." or any new and useful improvement on any art, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter not known or used. And I thought you might like to see the uh, US Patent Code section, should be section 101, it's a typo, uh, which today, which is very similar to Jefferson's language. The only subst substantial change is, the, uh, is from the word art to process. Um, so Jefferson still lives with us, uh, at least in US patent law. In 1836, Congress overhauled the act by requiring that patent applications be examined for novelty and originality, which they had not been since the 1790s, and by equipping the patent office to carry out both the statutory law and court interpretations of it. <clears throat> the act left Jefferson's definition of what was patentable unchanged. And the requirement of novelty implied that the naturally occurring products such as plants were not patentable because they were neither made by human beings nor new compositions of matter, machines, nor manufacturers. The courts had early on begun turning implication into law by establishing unequivocally that imported technologies did not qualify for patents because they were not new which meant that imported plants were also ineligible. The Supreme Court took a major step toward defining novel native varieties as similarly patent ineligible, when in 1852, in the landmark case of Leroy versus Tatum, which I've just put up here so you can see it in print, uh, it held that principles of nature were not patent eligible, that is principles were not patent eligible because they were not made by human beings, and that such principles extend beyond natural laws and forces to properties of natural matter. It was a short step from there uh, to the doctrine that products of nature as such could not be enclosed by patents. That doctrine lurked implicitly in several Supreme Court decisions in the latter half of the 19th century, <clears throat> excuse me, and it was articulated explicitly in 1889 by by the Commissioner of Patents, ben Benton J. Hall, in an internal ruling in the matter of ex parte Latimer, in, which I will return to later on. <clears throat> in the absence of patent eligibility, nurserymen devise alternate arrangements, both to incentivize innovation in fruit varieties and to protect their rights in the innovations once they were achieved. To understand these arrangements, we need to place the story in the context of the development of the American fruit industry. So first, a bit of background on that subject. In the American colonies and then the United States, 
of the late 18th century, only a handful of seed houses and fruit nurseries dotted the landscape, most occupying a few acres of land and cultivating a paltry diversity of stock. Whatever their size, virtually all these firms relied heavily for new plants, trees, or vines on importations from abroad that they then sold directly or as next generation seedlings. They also obtained advantageous new varieties from among their own plantings or from farmers and orchardists in the neighborhood. Rather than intentionally bred, most of these new varieties were chance finds in the fields, natural hybrids produced by the cross pollinations of birds, bees, and the wind that the proprietors then propagated asexually from cuttings, obtaining identical copies that they offered as seedlings for sale. Nurserymen offered, for example, the Bartlett pear, which originated in England, but was imported grown, imported, grown, and renamed by Enoch Bartlett on his farm in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and the Jonathan apple, which was named after Jonathan Hasbrook, a teenager who founded growing on a farm in Kingston, New York. In the revolutionary era, a few plant houses were themselves beginning to originate new varieties. Leading the way was the Prince Nursery, which had been established about 1720 at Flushing Landing, Long Island by Robert Prince, and which, was, and which his son William Sr. began in 1745 to turn into a prominent innovative enterprise. William Sr. understood that plant seeds are the products of sexual reproduction. That process had been identified in a few plants in the 1690s in Holland and abundantly confirmed in many others by the mid 18th century. With the aim of obtaining superior trees and say, so that is superior in resistance to disease or new varieties, William Sr. planted in close proximity a large number of high quality trees of the same variety of fruit and selected from the offspring any appealing new variety. He then reproduced a new variety or propagated, as people said, asexually from cuttings, obtaining indefinite numbers of, the, of them identical to the original. About 1790, employing this method, William Sr. planted the pits of 25 quarts of the green gauge plum and obtained trees yielding together a rainbow of fruits, including the white gauge, red gauge, and prince's gauge plums, all of which became standards in the American fruit basket. The Prince nursery flourished, tripling in size to 24 acres by 1790, aided by offering trees reliably true to the superior original and an expanding diversity of stock especially flowering and ornamental plants. The Prince Nursery remained a pace-setting horticultural player run by William and his descendants until the 1860s. Increasingly, after the opening of the 19th century, a few of the, business, the, the nursery business's leaders urged that fruit men create new varieties through deliberate hybridization. This involved taking the pollen from one plant variety and using it to fertilize another on an individual plant basis. However, such effort was discouraged by the difficulty of this manual procedure. The need of, the, the, the need of tweezers, magnifying glass, and a sure hand, and it also was discouraged by biology and economics. Sexual crosses of plants, trees, or vines yielded in the main unpredictable results, including often fruits unworthy of table or market. Then too, fruit trees tended to bear as long as three to nine years after planting. <clears throat> the outcomes were too uncertain to warrant the investment of land, time, and labor that hybridization re thus required. Most domestic plant innovation thus continued to arise from the plots of cultivators who found new varieties in their fields or gardens, the products of natural hybridization, or of Prince's method that they then selected and propagated. In their early days, nurseries tended to advertise in local newspapers 
a practice they continued into the late 19th century. But initiating their own advertisements in 1771, William Prince issued a one-page list of the fruit trees available in his nursery. And in 1783, William Bartram, a leading nurseryman in Philadelphia, put out a one-page broadside of the stock for sale at his family's garden. After the turn of the century, purveyors of seeds and plants added more sheets and turned them into bound catalogs. In content, these publications tended to comprise bare lists of the seeds, plants, or fruits available for purchase. Amid the dominant localism of the markets, there was little competition and hence little need for product and brand differentiation. Demand for plants grew as Americans moved west. Here you see the United States as it was eventually settled out to the Pacific. They moved first into the Ohio and Mississippi valleys and demand skyrocketed through the 19th century as the United States became a continental nation with canals, railroads, and steamboats turning markets from local ones into regional and national ones. The combination of rising demand and facilitating transportation greatly stimulated expansion in the nursery industry. In 1850, the US Census found about 8,500 nurserymen, seedsmen, and florists operating in the United States. Uh, in 1870, however, more than 50,000, and in 1890, 72,000. Among the standout new contenders were several firms, including notably in the Northeast, Hovey & Company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, run by Charles M. Hovey uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and, um, uh, and in Rochester, New York, George L. Wanger and Patrick Barry. Uh, who owned and operated the Mount Hope Nursery. The two enterprises would eventually take their place among the most prosperous and influential companies in the nation's nursery business. The proliferation of firms, whether large or small, national, regional, regional or local in reach, transformed the far-flung enterprise into a business essential to the increasingly specialized economy. It also generated an intensifying competition that steadily altered the business character, the character and, and orientation of the business. To the end of meeting competition, both the surviving companies and the new entrants placed a premium on offering multiple plant varieties every year, and especially important each year, a number of what the trade called novelties, or what we would call uh, innovations. In the main, new varieties of fruit, these were, that is the innovation, but they were also established varieties of greater hardiness or earlier bearing. However, the impersonality that came with the vastly expanding market also generated unscrupulous competitors, thieves of names and novelties. In the latter half of the 19th century, legitimate nurseries grew increasingly absorbed with safeguarding their brands and obtaining a return on their investments in their innovations. The effort and labor and dollars required to turn them, that had been required to turn them into marketable products. Increasingly, the firms came to recognize that the novelties as such represented a kind of property, what we call intellectual property, that they needed to protect. While they did not have the phrase though it was there in the US in the, by the 1840s, they didn't use it. They came to possess the concept, understanding well the economic advantage of preventing others from undercutting, appropriating, reproducing, and selling their new productions. To various measures that incentivized innovation in the absence of patents. Among them were the local horticultural societies that sprang up in a number of cities beginning in the 1820s. Prominent among these was the Massachusetts Horticultural Society, of which Hovey was an energetic member. <clears throat> the Massachusetts Society hosted sumptuous dinners, well lubricated with wine and Madeira, where members and guests extolled the uplifting value of their products 
and praised each other's accomplishments. The centerpiece of its meeting comprised lengthy tables laden with new fruits, vegetables, and flowers. Judges evaluated them in different categories of competition and awarded prizes to the best. The prizes were highly coveted and constituted a major incentive for the development of new varieties. They amounted to a seal of recognition and attested to the quality of the product, both of which could be turned to advantage in the competitive market. Nursery size, nursery size also facilitated the production of new varieties. The greater the number of trees, the more likely the occurrence of favorable chance hybridizations. Such practices produced novelties among the nurseries like Elwanger and, Elwanger and Barry's, for example, that cultivated trees and uh, which cultivated trees and plants by the thousands. But the adventurous proprietor of a small nursery might generate an advantageous hybrid in his field by a modified version of Prince's method. That is by planting two varieties together, then wait while nature took its re reproductive course. The process was practical for fruiting vines because they bore within, that is they bore fruit within a year or two. And if the new vinous variety proved exceptionally popular, it could earn the firm a fortune, much as later a blockbuster drug would turn the future of a biotechnology startup into gold. In the mid-1830s, the, mid the production by this process of a hardy and luscious strawberry, Charles M. Hovey not only uh, became, grew prominent, but also a wealthy man. A single plant produced one of the most remarkable crops of remarkable strawberries we ever saw, he said, and here you see the strawberry. Between 1838 and 1854, Hovey's seedling strawberry, as he named it, received the Massachusetts Horticultural Society's annual premium for strawberries at least a dozen times. It was so widely cultivated as to become the principal market and table strawberry for a decade or more. The leading fruit men also obtained novelties from smaller nurseries and farmers' commercial orchards. <clears throat> American horticulture was in, was in this way gifted with a Concord grape by Ephraim Bull, the proprietor of a small nursery in Concord, Massachusetts. Bull's new variety, developed using Hovey's method, ripened two weeks earlier than the earliest then known and yielded large clusters of delicious fruit good for the table and for the wine, and for wine. It created a sensation in the horticultural world after it was first exhibited at the Massachusetts Horticultural Society in 1853. The next year, Hovey, under contract with Bull, began marketing the grape nationally. By then, the mounting competition had prompted the leading nurseries to expand their use of advertising and catalogs, not only to gain market share, but also to establish and promote brand names. They advertise in newspapers, some in thousands of them, and in agricultural journals. They branded their novelties by naming them after themselves or their firms, sending to market, for example, what Hubby called Hubby's Cherry. They reinforced the brands by transforming their catalogs, replacing the bare list of fruits and flowers with selling descriptions of their productions that might include shape, taste, and color, uh, time to maturity, fecundity, and hardiness, and by presenting their firms as the grower's helper and friend. Distributing their catalogs by the tens of thousands, they made themselves well known among farmers, orchardists, and fanciers. I don't know if you can see this, this is from L. Wanger and Barry's catalog. Uh, a page in 1876. Uh, if you could, could see it, you would notice that each fruit is described. And earlier in the catalog, you would also see uh, printed a guide to um, when to plant, uh, how to care for the soil, prepare the soil, uh, and so on. A number of nurseries, and this is typical of all these catalogs by the, by the mid 19th century. A number of nurseries advertised and sold their pr productions through itinerant agents, 
who extended the range of their markets. Elwanger and Barry, eager to sell to the vast reaches of the settling West, were early and prominent in the use of agents, employing 69 of them by the 1860s. Eastern firms followed suit with the aim of competing for the Midwestern trade. For protection of their production, their innovations, a lot of nurserymen relied on the honesty of their local colleagues. In fact, in the local areas in and around towns and cities, the proprietors of nurseries knew each other, not least from the gatherings of their horticultural societies, <clears throat> and they often enjoyed personal ties. An etiquette of trustworthiness colored their business relationships. Ephraim Bull counted on it when before releasing a Concord grape for sale, he began promoting it and the, it and the White Concord, a novelty that soon followed, by inviting various nurseries to test them. The strategy posed risk to Bull's control of the vines. Given the ease of cloning fruit vines, competitors who obtained possession of Bull's vines could generate identical copies of his grapes and capture sales that might otherwise have been his own. The nurserymen in the Boston area refrained from such practices, holding to an honor code that respected the interests of originators. Those to whom Bull sent his conquered vines revealed several of the code's specific tenets. One or another pledged or swore on his honor that he would keep confidential the characteristics of any new fruit or even the vines that were in his possession until Bull authorized the release of the information that he would not propagate the vine for sale until one or two years after Bull put it on the market and that he would not compete with Bull by underselling him. However, the impersonality of expanding national markets allowed honor to diminish and die with distance. So what we get along with honesty locally is deception regionally and nationally. Distance, and distance enabled the entry into the market of sellers who lacked the personal ties and common values of the circles around a Prince, a Hovey, or an Elwanger and Barry. A noticeable number of the new breed cared, for more, cared far more about turning quick profits than about transforming the landscape and society. Profiteers, charlatans, and frauds, they knew little about the trade or its plants, their names, benefits, and growing requirements, especially after mid-century when so many new varieties were being introduced. They misrepresented their products, supplying customers with plants and seeds that did not live up to their advertisements of hardiness, healthiness, quality or fruit or color of fruit or color of flowers. Critics in the trade called them imposters, careless in their nurseries, evil overall. Among the worst perpetrators of these frauds were the freelance plant agents, who the main nurseries often relied on to sell their stuff, who offered these, these guys offered purchasers cheap, but usually unreliable stock, the identity and quality of which they misrepresented. Dubbed plant peddlers, some falsely claimed to be agents of reputable nurseries. Elwanger and Barry found that it had to caution the public against certain persons who are in the habit of using our catalogs and representing themselves as our agents, but who in reality have no dealings with us. Most commonly, others got a bona fide certificate of agency from a nursery, sold enough of the agency's products to maintain the certificate, and on the side, the American Agriculturalist Journal, noted in 1863, sold inferior and untrue trees, picked up here and there, at nominal prices. The journal called the horticulturalist found honest nurserymen undercut by fraudsters who could palm off, as they said, indifferent and worthless varieties of fruits and flowers as something new, extraordinary, and valuable at the most exorbitant prices. Buyers would be none the wiser at the time of the sale, given that the identity and character of, say, a hibernating rose or a quiescent vine did not 
reveal themselves for some months and that the fruit of a seedling tree often did not become manifest for five or six years after planting. Purchasers faced the hazard, uh, the hazard resembling the wine fanciers of buying a bottle labeled, say, Chateau Lafitte, that upon drinking proves to be a blend of mediocre varietals or worse. So how are they going to protect their production, their innovations, in the face of these deceptive practices, fraudulent practices, and evil behaviors. So to protect their rights, plant innovators had to specify the plant. That was the first requirement. That is, exactly define or describe it. This was easily accomplished with a tract of land, but not with a living organism such as a conquered grape. They re they resorted at first to trying to achieve descriptive integrity through words. The problem of specification was closely tied to the practice of naming. Hovey noted that the, pro that the proliferation of American fruits had been accompanied by a problem of growing concern to nurserymen, what he called, what he described as a confusion of nomenclature which has greatly retarded the general cultivation of the newer and more valuable varieties. Confusion was, was, if anything, an understatement. Fruits in the United States were bought and sold under a riot of synonyms that only grew worse with time. In 1875, William Housley of Leavenworth, Kansas, a compiler of apple synonyms reported that 29 varieties were known by 370 names, including 17 for the variety called the Ben Davis, 27 for the variety called the Ortley, and 36 for the Nickajack, which was one of the most widely consumed apples of the day. Housley called the, the tendency of so many old and fine varieties to be referenced in horticultural publications under new names, an intolerable evil, as he put it, and grievous to be born. Why such passionate objections to the wanton proliferation of synonyms, to a mere confusion of names? The reason was precisely because the practice lent itself to misrepresentation, fraud, and misappropriation. In the rapidly expanding nursery industry, Distance combined with the impersonality of the buyer originator relationship allowed some sellers, as I've said, to operate disreputably. They might obtain cheap, unreliable stock, then tell buyers it was the product of a reliable firm or sell it under the name of a prized variety of fruit or both. Buyers would be none the wiser at the time of sale, given that the identity and character of a tree and its fruit could not be determined simply by inspection. The disreputable agents might also somehow obtain seedlings of good stock by purchase or theft, propagate it, then sell the trees or vines under a different name from the one that recognized their finders or originators. We have to say that a good apple by any other name would taste as sweet. Nurserymen called for pomological reform as they put it, the establishment of means to protect the public against the flood of new varieties of little or no value. To that end, in 1849, a number of such pomologists met in Buffalo, New York, with the aim of establishing a national organization intended in no small part <clears throat> to regulate fruit names and descriptions. The Buffalo meeting led to the establishment largely largely at the initiative of a guy named Marshall Wilder, a prominent nurseryman in the Boston area, of the first national organization of fruit innovators and sellers, that is the American Pomological Society. It's name drawn from Pomona, the Roman goddess of fruits. At its founding, the society created a committee on synonyms and a linked catalog of fruits, Hopeful, as its president said, that an authoritative voice would be the best means of preventing those numerous impositions and frauds, which we regret to say have been practiced upon our fellow citizens 
by adventurous speculators or ignorant and unscrupulous vendors, greatly to the injury of the purchaser and fruit grower, to the dealer and the nurseryman, and to the cause of palmology. However, the society had no police power in the bailiwick of fruit names. Moreover, its verbal descriptions of fruits were as inexact, inexact as, for example, its description of the atom of the apple uh, called Autumn Seek No Further. They characterize it as, quote, a fine fruit, above medium size, greenish white, splashed with carmine, very good. In an evident attempt to add specificity to the, the descriptions, the catalog entries often included a cutaway black and white drawing of the fruit showing its interior structure. In the judgment of some number of pomological critics, words were simply not up to the task of capturing varietal differences. So how else to obtain descriptive integrity? Well, through pictures. Hovey himself recognized the inadequacy of verbal descriptions, whether published in the Pomological Society's catalog or in nursery catalogs, including his own. He had in mind a far more accessible means of dealing with fruit names and synonyms, the dissemination of accurate illustrations of the fruits themselves in color. Paintings and colored etchings had long been used to identify botanical specimens, including fruits. But oils and hand-colored etchings did not lend themselves to the widespread identification of fruits, even in small markets, let alone the steadily enlarging ones of the United States, which, as you know from the map I showed you, was very, very big, like Australia. Hovey fastened on a new technique, chromolithography, to accomplish his purpose. Devised in Europe in the 1830s, the chromolithography promised, chromolithography promised to enable the production of multiple faithful copies of colored fruit portraits. And here you have a, a chromo by a fellow named William Sharp. Uh, Sharp was an English painter, a drawing teacher, and lithographer who, who brought the technique to Boston. Chromo, he brought the, the technique of chromolithography to Boston in 1838 and promptly opened a shop to produce chromolithographs, as he called them. In 1847, Hovey en enlisted Sharp to begin publishing a series of chromolithographs of the nation's fruits. In 1853, Hovey published the series in a compendium that he titled The Fruits of America, Volume 1, which was followed by Volume 2 in 1856. And here you see the cover. And here are a sample, a couple samples of the chromolithographs uh, inside the book. For the picture of the hubby seedling strawberry uh, also comes from this book. And here is a pair, beautiful pair. Together, the two volumes comprise 96 vibrant, vibrant chromolithographs, each handsomely depicting a different fruit with its stem and leaves. Hovey declared in the preface to the first volume that he felt a national pride in beautifully portraying the delicious fruits in our own country, many of them surpassed by none of foreign growth, and thus demonstrating the rapidly developing skill of our pomologists to the cultivators of the world. But his aims transcended patriotic celebration. He averred that his principal object in publishing the work was to reduce the chaos of names to something like order. Hovey held that Sharp's plates showed that the art of chromolithography produces a far more beautiful and correct representation than that of the ordinary lithograph. Not everyone in the fruit world agreed. One critic, for example, holding that chromolithographs lacked that fidelity to nature and delicacy of tint, which characterized trees, uh, sorry, which characterized the best English and French colored plates done by hand. I leave it to you to decide. In the coming decades, chromolithographs would greatly improve in quality. Their costs would decline 
and they would become more widely used in the nursery trade, including even to depict the contents of seed packets. But at the time, users of fruit illustrations counted as superior portraits produced by the well-established technique of printing black and white lithographs or etchings that were then watercolored manually. Some nurseries used hand-colored plates in their catalogs. Most relied uh, on peddler's handbooks, which from the 1850s began to include such colored illustrations. One of the most widely used was a colored fruit book for the use of nurserymen, that's the title, first published in 1859 by uh, Dellen Marcus Dewey of Rochester, New York, which was a major center of both the fruit and the lithography industries. This uh, included 76 colored prints. Here you see one of them. Deluxe editions of Dewey's plate books, uh, edged. I mean, the, the aim of the, of, the, of the specimen book was for the salesman, or to provide the salesman with pictures of what the fruit of the trees that they were selling would actually look like. And of course, the salesman had to be honest uh, and, and trustworthy, but Dewey was alive to that. Uh, deluxe editions of Dewey's plate books, edged in gilt and bound in Morocco leather, served as prizes at horticultural fairs and as parlor table books. Dewey employed some 30 people, including several capable German, English, and American artists, a number of them women. He also published a, a book called The Tree Agent's Private Guide, which advised salesmen to impress customers that they were God-fearing, upright, and moral. That's how he took care of the trustworthiness issue. Eventually, by the late 19th century, however, despite all these methods that they had developed for incentivizing innovation and protecting the, product, the products of the effort, all the measures uh, taken by the seed houses and nurseries uh, aimed at to protect their brands, aimed at encouraging consumer confidence or it forced all in consumer to de deception, all of these proved inadequate. And the, by the late 19th century, the nursery trade began to turn for protection to both marketing by marketing and law. The measures were that they had been using were inevitably vulnerable to the ingenuity and brazenness of frauds and cheats of the kind I've described. Even illustrations could be made to lie. Anyone could obtain the plates and anyone could prey on gullible farmers showing them plates of strawberries, for example, uh, grown on trees, strawberries grown on trees, mind you, or blue roses, what the American agriculturalists called astonishing fruit. More important, if they safeguarded the brands to some degree, the measure served only indirectly to protect the innovator against appropriation of his or her novel fruit or flower, which meant from the theft of his or her intellectual property. The American Pomological Society had no police power. Its only weapon was moral suasion, which is to say that it had little authority to enforce uniformity in fruit names, descriptions, or qualities. Thieves could still clone fruit trees and vines and sell them by different names. In the marketplace, as distinct from the arena of descriptions, fruit innovators sought to protect returns on investment in their novelties by reliance on a pricing strategy. They might command a monopoly and a monopoly price over the novelty when it was first introduced, but the originator could not maintain market control over succeeding generations of the plant. The monopoly would thus end in the short time it took competitors to begin identically reproducing and marketing the product. Its price would fall rapidly, and so would the innovator's revenues. Under these circumstances, originators forged a strategy of protection that centered on selling the first release of new varietals at high prices. The price level reflected the fact that at first introduction, the supply of novelty of a novelty was limited, but the price was also intended to capture in the first several years of sales 
what economists would later call all the downstream revenues of which other propagators, authorized or not, might deprive the fruit innovator, the original fruit innovator. The nursery catalog of the day, catalogs of the day, reveal the pricing practice. For example, when in 1854, uh, Hovey first listed Bull's Conquer grape for sale, he priced it at $5 per cutting, a single cutting, a decided premium over the two to four dollars people charge for 100 plants at which common varieties were ordinarily uh, sold. The first season sales of Bull's Concord grape totaled $3,200, the equivalent of almost $110,000 today, a sizable sum. But faced with the rapid dissemination of the grape, Hovey had to cut the price from $5 to $3 a cutting. And just four years later, his contract with Hovey having ended, Bull sold them in bulk at deep discounts, as low as 20 cents each for 100 yearlings. In 1900, a knowledgeable originator of fruits summarily noted, a usual attempt to secure compensation from the first sales alone nearly always fails. Afterwards, the variety is the common property of the trade when the introducer's opportunity for profit is gone forever. In the late 1890s, the prolific young plant innovator, Luther Burbank, was furious at the state of affairs. Here is the young Luther Burbank. And here he is with his friends, Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, Edison in the middle and Ford uh, on the right. By the early 20th century, Burbank uh, and his California nursery uh, were ranked among the great inventors or innovators of the era. And he was class, he was held to be in the same class in fruits as uh, Ford uh, and Edison. In the 1890s, before he got so famous, Burbank fulminated to the readers of Green's Fruit Grower that he had been robbed and swindled out of my best work by name thieves, plant thieves, and in various ways too well known to the originator. A plant which has cost thousands of dollars in coin and years of intense labor and care, and which is, priceless, is of priceless value to humanity, may now be stolen with perfect impunity by any sneaking rascal. Many times have I named a new fruit or flower, and before a stock could be produced, some horticultural pirate had either appropriated the name, using it on some old, well-known, or inferior variety, or stealing the plant and introducing it as their own, or offering a big stock as soon as the original, as the originator commences to advertise the new variety. Now that pricing or any other private strategy seemed increasingly ineffective, nurserymen began in the 1870s, but with mounting intensity from the 1880s to call for assistance from government, notably through patent and trademark law in safeguarding what they now commonly called the rights of originators. However, patents on plants were foreclosed by the 1889 ruling in ex parte Latimer that I've mentioned earlier. Commissioner Hall had said in that ruling explicitly that it would be unreasonable and impossible, to quote him, to allow patents, again to quote him, upon the trees of the forest and the plants of the earth. Fruit innovators thus pinned their hopes on trademarks, tacitly assuming that the mark would not only protect the name of the novel plant or tree, but also secure the originator, the exclusive right to the living organism itself and to its propagation. However, that assumption was severely undercut in 1895 by the ruling of a federal appeals court in the case of Hoyt v. Lovett. James Hoyt and Edwin Hoyt <clears throat> were nurserymen in Connecticut. They had sued the J.T. Lovett Nursery in New Jersey <clears throat> for selling a grape that had been found in the Green Mountains in Vermont. The Hoyts believed they had bought the grape, the grape wood with exclusive rights, and they had trademarked it, trademarked it as the Green Mountain grape. 
the court found against the Hoyts, partly on grounds that certain facts in the case contradicted the tenets of trademark law as it had been judicially interpreted. But its decision also addressed the scope of trademark protection for living products. Apparently, Lovett's lawyer had raised the issue, contending that the protection of a trademark cannot be obtained for an organic article which by the law of its nature is reproductive and derives its chief value from its innate vital powers independently of the care, management, or ingenuity of man. The court itself, while noting that the question was novel and unprecedented, agreed with the lawyer, writing, to quote him, and I here have the quote uh, up on the, on the screen, writing, the Hoyts did not make the Green Mountain Vine, nor strictly speaking did they produce it. It grew out of the earth, was fashioned by nature, and endowed with powers and qualities which no human ingenuity or skill could create or imitate. If such protection as that now claimed by the complainants was allowed, a breeder of cattle could with equal propriety and reason demand like protection for the natural increase of his herd. In every aspect, such claims would seem to be impracticable and inequitable. Over the course of the 19th century then, to conclude, the horticultural enterprise had come to place a premium on protecting brand name novelties as such. By the end of the century, that effort had generated the aim of protecting the intellectual property in the trees, vines, and flowers that the brands represented. The Hoyt's resort to the new trademark law was emblematic of the drive, then emerging towards the protection of intellectual property by multiple means, but especially through the law in the material objects of the living world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. That was an excellent lecture. Um, now I would like to open the floor to questions, please. If anyone would like to raise their hand or put something in chat, I can read it out. Thanks for the interesting insights into the history of the fruit business in 19th century America. I'm curious to know whether these issues of fraud and protection were only taking shape at the local and national markets. More specifically, were there similar concerns of fraud and intellectual protection coming from fruit businesses in other countries, for example, the UK or European countries. Dan? Um, can you repeat the actual question itself? I didn't, yeah, basically, basically the question was, was similar things happening overseas at the time? Oh, I, I believe so. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I believe so. Uh, but it's, uh, I don't know of anybody who has actually studied this uh in say england and france and germany um from the point of view of fraud cheating and so on people have you know their their papers and books written about the the development of horticulture in these countries but not about my, my subject um my from my com limited conversations with uh scholars of um, horticulture in england and on the continent I think the same thing was happening, but it's more, much more difficult in say a small country like um, comparatively small, like France or England, or let alone the, the nation states of Germany or Italy uh, for these kinds of practices uh, to take hold without uh, um, consequential shaming uh, on a, uh, against the perpetrators. Um, you know, both, certainly France has a much more centralized system of everything uh, than the United States has ever had, uh, and Britain as well. Uh, and so you could get read, read out of the community. Uh, people took to, in the 20s, people tried to shame cheats and frauds here in the States but they didn't get anywhere because there was no way they could enforce the shaming. So whoever is looking for a subject, fraud, 
intellectual property protection, incentivize incentives, and so on, in all the countries of Europe is a great uh, virgin territory to explore. I might just, if I may, they ask a, a quick follow-up question. Um, I'm just particularly interested in whether you followed through on any of this work into contemporary practices in the United States. Um, I know in Australia that in certain sectors, such as um, ornamental plants, because the there's so because there's such the high turnover and there's such the, you know the the costs are so the profit margins are so low, people are really reluctant to sue. So other non-legal mechanisms are used. So there's a lot They're of reluctant to, reluctant to what sue each right. other. It's just not worthwhile going to court. So intellectual property, although it exists, oh right, right, yeah. it does. It's really much like 19th century America in lots of lots of areas. Do you know anything's the same in the states? Well, yes. Um, first of all, if they went to court, they would have a hard time proving their case. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Hoyt v. Lovett is one of the only cases I know about in the 19th century uh, that concerns you know, pro intellectual property dispute uh, uh, in, in horticulture. Uh, there were trademark suits once the trademark law got passed, but that had to do just with names. Uh, and there, was, uh, there were several cases in the late 19th century. But I'll tell you, to leap ahead to the 20th century, there was a firm that started in the very early 19th century named Stark Brothers. Uh, by the late 19th century, I didn't have time to go into it. Uh, it was ranked up there with uh, L. Wanger and Barry and uh, and the others and Hubby who, who were going out of business by that time uh, in uh, in size of market national market uh, it was a powerhouse and they uh, bought the rights to a a volunteer new variety of apple called the Golden Delicious which cropped up. Uh, on a, in an orchard in West Virginia during World War I. So one of the Stark brothers went and bought the rights for $5,000. Uh, he built a chain link fence around the tree, took home, a, they were in Missouri, took home a bunch of cuttings and propagated them and started selling the Golden Delicious. They sold it, and this is a new form of market production, protection. They sold it with a contract in which in order to get a seedling of the Golden Delicious you had to sign and you pledge yourself not to uh, sell the, any seedlings or give away any seedlings to anybody else. In short, you would be the only user. You could propagate it for your own orchard, but you could not do it for anybody else. So um, there were cheats, of course, uh, and uh, some people did. Uh, in fact, a number of people did uh, uh, gain, gain possession of the Golden Delicious uh, without having bought it from Stark Brothers. Stark Brothers maintain an entire legal department and use Pinkerton Detective in order to go after these people in the 1920s. But, uh, and, and the ethics of the, of, the, of the industry were still at that time um, such that when, the, when the, the lawyers for Stark Brothers wrote letters and said, you have the Golden Delicious and you're not supposed to have it, they said, oh, sorry, we didn't know that because often people got it who hadn't bought it from Stark by purchasing land on which the Golden Delicious was being grown. Uh, so uh, by a previous orchard owner. So when, when they were apprised by the lawyer who said you have to destroy them all, they did. Uh, because they were ethical, but not everybody was that ethical, was ethical in that way. There was one firm across the river, the Mississippi, uh, that uh, shamelessly sold the Golden Delicious. Uh, and when they were called to account by the Stark Brothers legal department, uh, they cited this ruling in Hoyt v. Lovett. But the Stark Brothers never sued the guy. Why? 
because they were afraid they would lose. Why did they fear a loss where well, they would lose? Because A, they were being, they were, you know, they were the standard oil of fruits, for one thing. So the local jury must, might not uh, uh, sympathize with their case. Secondly, it runs counter to human instincts uh, in the way that's articulated in the judge's ruling and uh, I mean, in the court's ruling in Hoyt v. Lovett, it runs counter to our instincts that anybody should be able to own the essence of a fruit. Uh, uh, after all, if it was there in the Garden of Eden, why shouldn't it be in the Garden of America and available to everybody uh, for better or for worse? So they were afraid they would lose because people did not like the idea, would not respond well to the idea that some firm, that anybody could own the, the, uh, the intellectual property rights in a given fruit variety, which included the right to propagate it. Uh, so they were afraid they would lose and they never sued anybody, uh, Stark Brothers. So that's a reason, not only the cost uh, and the uh, but the improbability of winning uh, and the uh, greater probability of losing that uh, suits were not brought. Nowadays, of course, everybody sues everybody else because it's all part of the biotech industry. Thanks, Dan. If there, I can't see any other questions. I'd just like to thank you, Dan, for a fantastic talk. Um, you provided some really important insights, I think some great lessons, and also some food for thought for other research projects going forward. Uh, and I'd just like to, on behalf of everybody, thank you very much for taking the time to, to do this presentation. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you very soon, I hope. Thank you, Brad, and thanks for everybody for their attention. Thank you. Bye.